What's up, peers, and welcome back to the World Crypto Network here for our analysis of the one and only cold card Mark II with clicky buttons. Yes, yes. Uh, and of course, these clicky buttons are used first and foremost at the very first step to type in your pin. And the pin for the cold card is an entire other rabbit hole to fall down to. Uh, so we're going to discuss this today and in the next video tomorrow uh, much more thoroughly uh, with then the application. Uh, today, though, uh, we really want to make sure that we get the theoretical input in first, right? So we'll accumulate knowledge here firsthand from the GitHub repository of the cold card especially the file uh, in the firmware in the docs called pin entry markdown and this is uh, written by clark moody and by peter gray uh, two of the contributors here uh, so thank you very much for writing this very very excellent piece on how the cold card pin is designed and operational so let's get into the reading what happens when i enter a pin you enter between two or six digits of your pin uh, the, the code prefix and press OK, the check mark. The cold card will use those digests to find two specific words from the BIP39 word list. These two words respond a unique, uh, is unique to cold card, to your cold card and the pin combination. Look at the words. Are they right? And what do you expect? It? If not, press X and try again and or talk to your evil maid about her activities because you might have changed them. Do not continue to enter more digests of your real pin. If you want to proceed and you want to have a secondary wallet enabled, press two to select the secondary wallet. Otherwise, just press okay to continue to your primary wallet. Then enter the remaining digest of the pin between two and six digits and press okay. Is it the user defined brick me pin? If so, it's used to wipe the secure element and irreversibly brick the cold card immediately. There is no delay, even if the failed pinned attempts are recorded. The pairing secret is rolled with a forgotten value, so it's impossible to ever talk to the secure element again. Before enabling this feature, please triple check your backups are correct. Seven, calculate the required delay to punish the previous incorrect pin attempts. The current attempt counter of the target wallet, one or two, is observed, is observed. And the difference between the counter's current value and the recorded, the last successful attempt level, is used. If there has been an incorrect attempt previously, then make the user wait some more time here. And eight, after the delay, check the pin. The pin is checked in this order. First, is the pin for the duress wallet? If so, open the wallet and continue, as if it was the normal one or two wallet that was picked in step four. Otherwise, we increment the pin attempt counter for indicated wallet at this point. Check if the pin is right. If it is, use the pin to record the pin attempts counter new value, typically plus one and read out the encrypted secret. System is open. Or if the pin is wrong, tell them and start over. Notes, it is possible to use the same pin for both main and secondary wallet. A wrong pin attempt on secondary wallet will not count against the primary wallet. We can only support two seats, full wallets, because the chip has only two counters for pin attempt tracking. We could wipe the device when too many pin attempts happened, but we cannot recover it as a blank reusable device due to the security design. There is a separate independent duress wallet available for both wallet one and wallet two. There is no attempt limit rate limiting for the duress pins, but since the same incorrect pin is attempted on the real wallet, the attempt counter is effectively used to protect the duress pin as well. Dark duress thoughts. If you are relying on the duress pin, you should probably have a brick me pin as well. Very smart attackers could monitor the data bus between main micro and the secure element. When the duress password succeeds, activity on the bus will be clearly different from the normal pin. There is nothing we can do about this 
because traffic analysis of the bus is not hard, even though the, all the sensitive data is encrypted. However, on the screen, we will keep everything looking normal. And in fact, we try hard not to reveal to the main firmware that the RAS pin was used successfully. So if there, was, uh, if there are wires connected to your cold card while you are being forced to enter a pin, then you probably use the brick me pin instead of your duress pin. The attackers could tell when the brick me pin has worked, but when the brick me pin works, the cold card will immediately use it to destroy the main pairing secret. This renders the secure element useless. This happens in about 50 milliseconds, and it's done long before anyone gets an on-screen confirmation that it worked. There is little time to interrupt this or jam the bus to stop it. The system firmware always attempts the brick me pin before checking the pin is correct for duress or normal use. But really, you should rethink your life choices before getting in these situations. Secret keystrokes versus special pin codes. We considered various secret key presses to trigger the duress or brick features. But the approach does not work because there is an internet and we have to document these features on it. You might not be able to directly touch the subject cold card at the critical moment. You might be forced to give a pin code via phone or text message. You can write down a duress or prime pin in places where it might be found by an attacker, but you cannot trick someone into pressing an undocumented key at a specific time. Special pin codes are fully configurable for the same reasons. We cannot make 666-666 do something special if a quick Google tells anyone that's a trap. Where is the pin stored? All the pins are stored inside the secure element. The firmware does not know the pin until you enter it, and then it checks this. If it checks it is right using the secure element and may load the wallet seat if it works. To be able to read the secret, the wallet seat, out of the secure element, the pin is required. In fact, you have to hash the pin with a random number, nonce, generated by the secure element. This is the main protection against replay attacks and monitoring the bus passively. Furthermore, you cannot separate the secure element from the main micro and then brute force the pin. Monitoring the connection to the success secure element does not reveal the pin or any protected secrets. There is no way to read or change the wallet seat without the pin. There is no way to change the pin without knowing the old pin. There is no way to directly read the pin. Pin attempts counter cannot be reversed or reset ever. Only actual no correct knowledge of the pin can update the last successful record, that is the mark pin attempts as successful. The main wallet pin is required to update the flash contents and create a genuine light green. All of the above claims are enforced by the secure element itself. The only policy that is enforced by our firmware is the pin attempt timeout periods. The code that does that is in a specially restricted area we call the bootloader. It cannot be changed in the field. All interactions with the secure element are authenticated themselves with something we call the pairing secret. Thus, to test the pin value, you need that pairing secret. Only the bootloader knows the pairing secret, so it is able to enforce rate limiting and other policy choices. But I forgot my pin. Sorry, there's nothing we can do. Without knowledge of the pin, it is impossible to read out any of the secrets of the secure element. That is true even if one knew the pairing secret and could talk directly to the chip. Even if you knew every byte of the main flash, and you do as it's open source software. And even if you dis, uh, dissolve desolder it, the secure element, and attack it with a supercomputer. 
the only downside to this design is the legitimate customers who have forgotten their PIN and tragically have also lost their seed backup. The firmware will force them into ever longer delay cycles between attempts, but they are free to spend the rest of their lives attempting to find the right PIN. It's not possible to, for, for us to wipe the device and start again as a fresh device. We cannot write the wallet seat stored into a secure element without the pre previous PIN. The PIN to secret value hashing. The low level bootloader firmware supports the pins of any length up to 32 characters. We recommend splitting that evenly between the prefix and the final parts. And we will force you to provide a minimum of two digests at digits as the prefix for the anti-phishing feature to work well. Due to the num numeric key path, we have to limit pins to numeric digits. Internally, the character in the pins are hashed as followed. A double SHA-256 hash of the pairing secret, the purpose solved, and the pin di digits where the pairing secret is a 32-byte secret kept by the bootloader. The purpose salt, which is a 4-byte value linked to the usage of the pin, which is the prefix versus the real pin. And the pin digits, which are ASCII digits, or it could be any octets uh, for custom solutions. This double hashed value is what's stored inside the secure element, 32 bytes. It cannot be read back out. And when it's written, which requires proving knowledge of previous pins, it is encrypted as it travels on the bus. Because of the inclusion of the pairing secret, the hashes generated by each cold card will be different. Genuine versus caution lights. The green light will be lit only if the entire flash memory contents are unchanged since the last time you logged in with the main pin. This is enforced cryptographically by the secure element, which is the only way to change the light because the signals for the light connect exclusively to the secure element and are not connected to the main microprocessor. Every time when the system starts, the entire flash is hashed using double SHA-256 and the pairing secret is part of that, as is every single byte of flash in the chip so it will be a unique per device. The expected value of the hash is not stored expect, expect, except in the secure element. The bootloader writes whatever it calculates into the secure element, and the secure elements will only turn on the light if it matches the expected value. There is no way to read out what the hash is supposed to be, and no way to change the state of the green and red lights without the hash, the pairing secret. The red and the green lights are directly connected to the secure element chip and do not interact with the main micro. When the user upgrades the firmware, they can use the main pin code to capture the update hash value into the secure element. Code signatures. The bootloader will not run the main firmware if it is unsigned or signed incorrectly. This means only CoinKite Incorporate can produce firmware that will run on this platform. We are open to suggestions on how we could safely allow third parties to write software that can be run on the device. Here are some of the approaches we have considered. A red PCB version of the hardware that looks different and therefore cannot be used as a doppelganger, but does not enforce the firmware signing policy. The user can opt into a particular key from another vendor or their own key if they are a developer. The main pin would be required to do the opt-in and it would probably be a one-way trip. Some sort of centralized service that signs binaries, if we trust your team, a walled garden, considered a hopeless approach, but in our list regardless. Regardless of the code signing policy, we want the, the genuine caution feature to work and be useful defense against mates. We want everyone to be able to experiment on our platform 
and their coins are just as precious to them as Bitcoin are to us. Production versus development key. What we have done to satisfy these needs is as follows. The bootloader knows and trusts five public keys. The main firmware code is always checksummed and needs the correct signature. The private part of key zero has been published on GitHub as part of the source tree. Keys one through four are factory keys and we will keep secret. Official releases are using key one for now, but all keys other than zero are considered official. Experimental code written by anyone can be signed with key zero and the bootloader will accept it. However, if the genuine light is red, it will show a scary notice uh, to the user during boot time and enforce a delay of 25 seconds. If the main pin is used to bless the firmware, meaning that the light is green during boot, the warning message is not shown and boot up procedures as normal. Here is what the warning screen looks like. Danger, caution. How to develop professional code on cold card. Hire and pay a dev to write the changes. The dev signs the binary release with the private zero key published in our GitHub. You give the firmware binary file to the user via web download probably. They upgrade via the normal process to copy it to the micro SD or the USB upgrade. On the first reboot, the big unauthorized firmware warning is shown with delay. If they know the main pin, since they are the owner, they follow the process to set the green light. Next reboot and the following, as long as the genuine method is maintained, they boot without warnings. Benefits, no warnings, but still trusted, trustable thanks to at ec C5081, 8A, which is the secure element. Random devs can replace 99% of the firmware at the micro Python layer, but they need to retain our code to, for talking to the bootloader and the secure element so that the pin can be entered and verified. All pin related policies is enforced by unchangeable bootloader code per this document. Limitations. If new devices is intercepted from our factory, for example, without a main pin set, anyone could put any code onto it and it would boot exactly like a real factory direct unit. That is why we need a serialized tamper evident bag. Flip side of this limitation, all corners can ship a modified version of our product that boots and runs normally when their customer first gets it. Obvious hack attack. The idea, find or steal a cold card. Load your Trojan firmware onto it, profit. But you don't know the main pin, or else you would have already stolen the funds. So changing the firmware is not easy, since it does little without the main pin. You will have to crack the welded case and do some difficult soldering. Regardless, once you've changed the firmware, the red caution light will show. And since you cannot set the genuine light without the pin and your Trojan is signed with key zero, then the victim gets back that they will see the big unauthorized firmware warning, plus the red light and probably some scratches on the case, etc. A weak assumption, helpfully power up the cold card for them and say, here, is, it is ready for your pin, sir. No idea why the light is red today. So we need to warn users to power up the cold card themselves every time they enter the pin. Four types of wallets, one cold card. The cold card effectively supports four independent wallets, the primary main wallet, the secondary, the main duress, and the secondary duress. The secondary wallet is a little less capable than the main one, since the main pin is needed for changing certain configuration values and enabling the genuine light. However, the secondary wallet has the same secret protection, the pin retry counters and so on. The intention is that the main secondary wallets are completely independent for, of each other in terms of funds and wallet seats. 
the duress wallet could store any 72 byte secret and it's well protected as the main secondary secret but we only enable use of the duress wallet when attempting to access to the corresponding main secondary wallet the pin failure and retry delays are linked together we also hide the fact that the duress wallet pin was used successfully these lies are prom promoted by the boot rom code to higher level of softwares and operation proceeds normally when creating the duress wallet cold card derives the wallet root from the real wallet by a one-way process this means when you back up the main wallet you're also backing up the corresponding duress wallet and it give and its giveaway funds writing down the main wallet seed words will include the duress wallet and its funds the duress wallet operates like any other wallet on the cold card and load value and sign transactions as normal by design it acts just like a normal wallet either main or secondary as part of your preparations for the bad day when you need it you should load it with some funds after setup recovery of funds from the duress wallet to recover funds from the duress wallet import your original seed words into a new cold card and assign a duress pin again then log in to the duress wallet and re-import that into your desktop wallet alternatively if you have the 7c encrypted backup file decrypt that and import the extended private shown inside the duress wallet you could also calculate the extended private key based on the seat or extended private key of the real wallet we use bip32 sub key paths to derive the duress wallet if m was your real wallet then the duress wallet will be found at m of 2,174,000 and a bunch more <laughs> where uh, slash zero slash zero where this large number is the hexadecimal of 80 million and the hexadecimal of cc10 problems with changing the pin code on a duress wallet we want users and thugs who are locked in with the duress pin to experience a duress wallet a, a complete wallet experience however there are some problems when they start to change the pin codes like a normal user would if they try to change the main pin code then we can detect that and change the duress pin code instead to them it looks like the main pin was changed successfully however if they try to change the duress pin code we cannot allow that to work for one thing we have a no we 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 have nowhere to show the new pin code nor a fake wallet to give them if they try to use it for this reason if they lock in with the duress pin we always pretend like there is a duress wallet enabled already to change the duress pin it requires the previous duress pin and we show the same error as if they entered the wrong old pin if you are somehow faking uh, facing an attacker who is willing to verify that he has the real main pin it's possible that careful analysis of the system responses will imply he's working with the duress pin. If you discover any sequence that reveals this easily, please tell us and we'll see if we can cover, cover them up even better. If this is a scenario that concerns you, you may be asked what the actual duress pin is while under duress. We suggest providing the brick me pin in this case. Alternatively, you can say you set the duress pin code once, but have since forgotten it. A related problem, if the duress pin counts as a failure of the real pin, it would be obvious when it's used. Therefore, we cannot bump the counter unless we know the pin is not the duress pin. Known limitations, when you log in with the duress pin, the real pin failure counter cannot and should not be reset. We suppress display of that count if we know that the duress pin was recently used anti-phishing features we ask the user for a number of prefix digits from the pin 
in response, two words are shown. How do we get those words? The string of prefix digits is hashed using SHA-256. And that digest is used as the message to be authenticated by a standard HMAC SHA-256 operation defined in FIPS-198-1. Uh, the HMAC SHA-256 key is contained in the secure element and is performed the HMAC operation. The 256-bit key for the HMAC is known only to that specific chip, and it does not exist anywhere else. The 22 bits of the HMAC results are converted into two words from the BIP39 English word list. Because these are just two words to remember, we hope that our users can memorize those words and use this as a simple test if they're talking to their cold card and not a doppelganger. There are about 4 million, 2 to the power of 22, possible word combinations. And so as long as your PIN prefix is kept secret, it should not be possible to display the correct words. If an attacker did know your PIN prefix and had access to your cold card wallet, he could enter the prefix and note the word displayed. From there, they could make a replacement cold card that captures the remaining digits after displaying the correct two words. However, if the victim tries a few different pin prefixes, they can protect themselves, limited only by their mental storage capability of random words. Uh, so you don't even have to use your real pin prefix for testing against phishing. You can enter and cancel as many attempts before proceeding with your real pin. Personally, I plan to search until I find a memorable pair of words like Angleburger or Lazy Goose. As for exhaustive attacks, where all possible pin prefixes from a particular subject cold card can be captured, the bootloader implements some simple rate limiting to limit the rate of extracting the words, and the attacker must work through that interface, since pairing the secret is unknown. All of the results would need to be stored on the device, and if they tried to be exhaustive, but assuming a weaker four-digit prefix, that only, that's only 30k of data. If this type of tag is of your concern, we suggest using the longest possible pin prefix. We are rate limiting this as follows. 150 milliseconds response time for the first 10 values. Then 2.5 seconds for each of the next 15 up to 25. At 25 tries, we crash the system and the power cycle will be required to continue. With about 9,099 combinations to cover all the four prefixes, it would take between at least 10 hours to generate all the four digit prefixes. To achieve that, you would have to write custom firmware and to get it onto the device. Any successful login resets the rate limiting, so normal users will never see the impact of this limiting. How it works. We've made some bold claims above. And how can you be sure that we implement it as described? First, please learn more about the secure element, the microchip ATECC508A. The full data sheet has recently been made public after being under a non-disclosure agreement for years. To get further into our design, you will need to understand the chip's capability. Background, the 508A has 16 key slots. Each can be configured in numerous ways. The chip has two high endurance monotonic counters, which we use to track pin attempts. Additionally, it has OTP memory and general flash storage that we are not using. None of the elliptical curve features are being used in this project, although we have used them on the OpenDive project. The chip starts with the blank configuration zone, which must be fully defined and locked before, forever before using the chip. The policy set in the configuration defines the relations between the keys and what data is public or private. See this bootloader key layout Python to understand the contents of the configuration zone. That code establish this set of keys. Pairing is one, a shared secret with the bootloader code. 
Words are two, random values used for the anti-phishing feature. Pin one is three, the pin for the main wallet. Pin two is four for the pin for the secondary wallet. Last good one is the last successful login attempt for the main pin. And last good two is the last successful login attempt for the secondary pin. Pin three is the duress pin for the main wallet. Pin four is the duress pin for the secondary wallet. Secret one is the wallet seed main for the 72 bytes of the ultra sequence. Secret two is the wallet seed for the secondary, the 72 bytes of ultra secret. Secret three is the secret for the duress main. Secret four is the secret for the duress secondary. BrickMe is the BrickMe pin storage. And the firmware is a hash of the flash contents, controls, and the red and green lights. So the key slot 0 and 15 are reversed because of the chip's limitation. Each key slot, aka the data slot, can be restricted for reading, writing, and authenticating by depending on another slot. So for example, the secret 1 slot requires knowledge of the pairing secret as the authentication key, and then also knowledge of the pin 1 slot before you can read or write as read key or write key. Each of the pin slots, 1 to 4, unlock the next corresponding secret N slot of the read-write of the secret. The last good slots are word-readable, but need the corresponding pin to change. Note that all key slots require the pairing secret to do anything. That is, it is the authentication key for those slots. The pairing secret itself is not readable and can be changed only by the break me pin. We do this so that we can trash the secure element by rolling the pairing secret to a new value and then forgetting what the value is. In fact, we do not calculate the new value since we're being, <laughs> we're being destructive. It should be noted that only key rolling is permitted, not general write. And so you need to know the previous value of the pairing secret in order to change it. The firmware key slots holds a hash value, and you must prove knowledge of that value to be able to turn the genuine light green. Anyone can turn this light to red. It's a unauthenticated. Uh, but you must know both the pairing secret and the existing value of key slot 14 to turn it, the light green. We can capture and store a hash of the entire flash memory at any time but updated, knowledge of the main pin is needed. You may confirm the above configuration details as the configuration zone is not read protected, read protected, and it can be read very easily. It can be done from MicroPython level, or you could connect directly to the chip. Knowledge of the keys. In this document, we say you need knowledge of a specific key to be able to do something. What that means in practice is that you have to complete this sequence. Pick 20 bytes of a nonce, num in. Do a nonce command, which takes the 20 bytes and returns 32 bytes. The 32 bytes you receive are a random value picked by the chip. Take the 20 you provide and the 32 from the chip and hash them together to make a shared nonce value. Take your knowledge of some key you think is in the chip and hash it with the shared nonce. Do a check Mac command, which sends the Mac to the secure element. If it does not like the value because it does not match with the value calculated itself, then it fails. Once a check Mac is done, you prove, you've proven that you know the indicated key slot's value. Every key on the chip has been configured so that the above sequence must be completed with the pairing secret. After the most slots need the same sequence to be repeated with another secret, such as the user-defined pin, after the two check mag sequences are done, you may be able to read or update a specific field. The actual read-write data may also be encrypted, which involves XOR, of the data against a hash generated by a similar sequence of steps. Again, we with a random nonce involving using the gen digest command. 
the fun part of programming this chip is the constant values and other clever things they mixed into the digests uh, required at each step. A simple update can require a number of back and forths, each time creating a new shared nonce. Specific parts of the chip's configuration zone and the argument arguments to that specific command are often included in the hashes. Of course, every single bist must be correct or nothing works, and a meaningless error is returned. Security rate limiting pin retries. In our system, we do not trust the main firmware with any secrets, at least until it proves it knows the pin. To achieve this separation, the bootloader picks the pairing secret and keeps it secret. We use a hardware firewall feature of this chip. It monitors the internal memory bus, and if it sees an address inside the firewall range, it simply resets the entire chip. That firewall protects the entire bootloader section from any access from other code running on that chip, regardless of how that might happen. The bootloader configures the firewall and verifies the flash memory protected uh, protections when it boots the system. During the operations, the main firmware written in MicroPython can be called into the bootloader to communicate with the secure element and do a few other functions. All access to the bootloader's firmware is done indirectly via this cal gate, a call gate, which opens the firewall in a very limited way. Entry and exit from the call gate is handled carefully and does things like wipe all of the SRAM used in the bootloader uh, with known values both on entry and exit. In order for the main user interface to test a pin code, it must use a call gate and the calls involved require a fairly complex call sequence. First, a setup step is needed that loads the retry counter and establishes how long a delay will be required before we check the pin attempt. Then, the delay must be passed by another call throughout the call gate. The delay is done inside the bootloader just so that we know how long it is, and so there is no way to bypass it. We do this in increments of 500 milliseconds because we want to maintain a nice display and user experience during the potentially long time period. After the timeout period is completed, we will attempt using the pin value and if it's right, provide the secret. This sequence is implemented with a data structure that is signed by the HMAC generated by the bootloader. The HMAC includes both the pairing secret and also a unique value per boot to prevent replays. Delay policy. Here is the delay. Uh, here is the delay you'll be forced into the base on the number of failed pin attempts since your last successful login. From 1 to 2, 15 seconds. 3 to 4, 1 minute. 5 to 9, 5 minutes. 10 to 19, 30 minutes. 20 to 49, 2 hours. More than 50, eight hours. Limitations. The main pin holder can brute force the secondary wallet's pin because they can use the API for pin changes without rate limiting. Some MicroPython code would be need, uh, could, some MicroPython code would need to be written. Similarly, the brick me and the rest change pin commands are not rate limited. So if you have the main pin or secondary you could brute force the corresponding pin codes. Pierce, that was a very long reading of the very thorough cold card pin design and operations. And I think you will agree with me that the cold card here has done some very thorough analysis of the different attack vectors that might be possible with the pin. Uh, and thus, I would say that Colcard is, again, very secure uh, and, and very design-focused here. Uh, and I really appreciate that. So, of course, the Colcard, you really should get yours. And I know that this uh, reading was very long, um, maybe somewhat technical. Uh, and so in the next video tomorrow, we will go step-by-step step on how you can actually set up the different pins. And I will give just a brief summary and my thoughts on this. Um, but I don't want to make this video any longer. Uh, so thank you very much for joining me here today. And of course, if you want to get one of 10 free cold cards, uh, then you can enter uh, our little contest here. Uh, the rules are quite simple. You have to have contributed to an open source project, and you have to tell us why the cold card is awesome and why you need it. 
if you yourself have not yet contributed to an open source event, oh sorry, no cold card for you, unless you start uh, contributing now today, that would be fantastic. Or even better than you tell us someone uh, who has contributed and who you think deserves our gratification here uh, for making open source software possible. Thank you very much for watching this and see you on the next show. Bye-bye.